I had been given, I had just had a, a book contract with a, a publisher called Granta, who's very well known in, in, uh, in the UK. And they gave me a mag an edition of their magazine that was called the Africa Issue that they did in 1994. And I was reading it on the train. I was doing a master's in England at the time. And I was reading it on the train and I thought, this is terrible. Like, this is England. I mean, for what, lack of a better thing, this is... There are African writers everywhere in London, well-known, globally recognized writers, and they, they couldn't find one. Well, they found one in the entire issue to write about Africa. So the writing was this missionary, reportage, save Africa kind of nonsense. And it was very shocking to me at the time because I was like, you mean, you mean a serious magazine can do something like this? So... Um, I wrote to the editor that night. I had met him in the morning. A long email, just analyzing the whole issue. And I was like, what's wrong with this thing? And so he said, oh, I'm not the one who edited it. <laughs> so then about a year later, they decided to do another Africa issue of the same magazine. And um, so they asked me to do something. I can't remember what else I was doing. I think we were editing Kwani here. So I kept delaying writing something until the last day. Then the, the editor, there's a guy, guy called, uh, gosh, Matt Wayland. And he was like, why don't do something from that email? So I looked at the email, just did it in a few hours and posted it. There. But I told them, make sure you put it up online. And so it went up online for free. So it just went viral when it went online. And now it's kind of just all over the place. Yeah. So Africans enjoyed it as a way of in, us enjoying, laughing at how stupid they are, mm -hmm. yes. Um, also, Africans also enjoyed it by telling all their Western friends, look, read this, right? Um, the Western friends said, oh, I didn't know this was the case, but power, power always makes you innocent. Y you know what I'm saying? So... Like 15 years ago, that's what Achebe was saying about half heart of darkness. And everybody was like, oh, I wasn't aware. Uh, you know, so that, so for me in the West, it given me fame in terms of translations. I met the German president. I met the Norwegian president. And they're like, oh, but you told us it's the truth. Uh, but it's just saying, yeah, it's not changing anything. What happens is when you have the power dynamics themselves change, then we can have that conversation. So this thing was just meant to, just in case you haven't forgotten. That's what that piece is. We remain where we were 100 in our relationship with, with Europe in particular and the West. We remain where we were in 1885. Just in case you for, didn't forget, nothing really has changed in that relationship. I'm not as angry at Afropolitanism as I was before. <laughs> um, look, I, I think uh, you, what, you, what, you, what you've had, and maybe particularly in the diaspora, you know, in the big cities, in New York, in London, and everything else, is this idea that uh, there is there's this black elite, black African elite, who are able to purchase these products, clothes like this, and da 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 da, and are inventing new things, and they have a fashion week, and and uh, uh, they meet in Paris, they meet in London, they meet in Africa, and they can mix all these things in a remix, uh, um, and so it's this kind of identity um which which bears no responsibility it consumes sometimes it creates 
uh, but it, it has no residence in any solid value. I, I you know, so um, it's a fashion. It's a cool fashion. It doesn't have legs, and it, it, it's not going to last very long. Uh, but if it's going to bring us nice clothes, I don't mind. You know what I mean. But it's as something to take seriously. Um, you know, I, I think Achil Bembe and company have written about Afropolitanism, and I think that the idea was a different idea actually um, than the one that got picked up as a sort of commodity. Yeah. And I think that the idea that um, one of the unique the, one of the unique situations about being African is that you, you, you have societies in a funny way who, uh, in certain way, were never really colonized uh, to the point at which you, you're so many many urban, urban Africans speak five languages. Uh, you're all living in a society where the sound of many languages and cultures is just part of who you are. And you're very comfortable in that cosmopolitanism. It's not a shocking thing. And it's a thing that is very, very old and very enduring, right? Um, the idea of a kind of Pan-African, I'm a Pan-Africanist, of, of a Pan-African movement to you know, to, to open borders, uh, to trade, think, imagine freely across the continent is something that's very deeply important to me. When I came back, you know, we were just talking about Afropolitanism, you know, um, so What the wrong kind of Afropolitan gives you, it gives you immunity. What immunity is, is you have a credit rating in America. Uh, what immunity is, is you have a green card. Okay? I don't have a green card. But, like, I could get one. It's not, like, uh, or you have many stamps on your passport, and so when you want a Shenzhen, go to Shenzhen, you can go in Shenzhen. Um, so you, be, you, you, you become this kind of internationalized class of people who uh, call yourself an intellectual or are this and you are changing the continent and everything else. But you're completely immune in reality to, to the continent. And that immunity, once you have it, it kind of stays, you know, and but it, it, how you see and how you interact is fully infected by that immunity. So you, you can encounter and have compassion for something happening to somebody who hasn't got immunity, uh, but only with sympathy, like, oh, you people, you know, like that, fine. Now, it's not that I want to live in a dangerous place. But leaving America and coming back here was a kind of deliberate act. And I, I did so not because of just politics or something. I was bored, right? Like, when I was here, there was a lot more adventures going, more making literature, we were doing all these things. And getting a big institutional job in America was more institutional politics of the university. Da -da 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 -da. And it was really just, you know, uh, and I came to a point where I thought to myself, I said, you know, I've been lying to myself in that Afropolitan way that you can build an African literary institution out of New York, and that's a lie. You can't. So once the lie was exposed, it became easy to leave and come back home. Just I quit my job, came back home. And now, so... In terms of finding my feet, things started to happen. A friend of mine died of AIDS. Young guy, poor guy. Uh, somebody else died of AIDS as well. Um, and by this kind of, in both cases, almost like a suicide, like self-neglect. 
in that kind of shamed way of being gay in a place and you could no longer be bothered to think in the long term. You know what I mean? So, so that was one. Two, so I was like, I wanted to have a contract here. I, I'm, I, I'm strangely those believers. I'm a believer in whether you want to call it Africa rising, Africa regenerating. Uh, that's why I'm here. I want to be here while this hurricane of change happens. Uh, for the good, the bad, the ugly. To be beating the bad and the ugly. And then to be jumping inside the ships of the good. You know, and going with them. <laughs> The government will use it as a political stick, but it's not going to be policed. Uh, like the police have enough trouble finding like a thief, so they're not going to go and invest any, anything at all, in the idea of uh, we have an organized way of going to peep into people's bedrooms. They're not. Uh, what they are going to do is, as the election comes you're going to find some political leaders mysteriously becoming homosexuals, for example. Uh, there'll be like a lot of blackmail. But also what happens is, and that's I think for now what's most dangerous, is a lot of social vig vigilantism. The government has pretty much, the, the law pretty much gives permission for people to take something out of the hands of the state. That's what's unsaid, right? So if you go to that neighbor and beat them up or strip them uh, or humiliate them and drag them off to the police station naked, uh, the police may have the stamina to, to, to test the case and then your family will pay a bribe or something like this. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so now, so people in vulnerable places economically and otherwise are going to be at risk, random risk, but it's not going to be cons consistent or constituent. The real c consequences are an increased sense of fear in the public domain, an increased sense of threat in the public domain, even other than the issue of homosexuality. That law was just make it make you encourage your fears and then allow the state to maintain control. For people like in Spain, uh, my generation is called the IMF generation, and that's kind of what this book is about. That's what I call them, right? Because we are the generation that saw the middle class fall apart. Um, in the 90s, uh, late 80s and 90s, with the IMF conditionalities that said no subsidies for education, and so people left the country, mm -hmm. or people fell, F or fell, fell, and fell, and then fell again until they could fall and they sold fruits, you know. Um, and then came out, I don't know, different, tough, tougher. Uh, more cynical, but very anti-authority for a while. And anti-democracy movements became very big. And we are still sort of in that zone. And in a certain sense, that's kind of what the book is about, is being an African in these, in these times. I write in English. We go to school in English or French or Spanish or Portuguese in Africa. That's a colonial situation. And no force big enough has broken that idea. Uh, so I'm interested in how, as someone local, you speak to your local and you speak to the world, and that you use that language like as a seduction and as a weapon, so that you're bringing readers to the center of your world, who are out there in those powerful places that speak or run the world in English. In the 90s, as the economies were falling apart, the churches got a lot more power, but different kind of power. The Pentecostal churches from America came in, and now they're everywhere. 
uh, and they are more like the ultra conservative right uh, and so a lot of places to think and imagine were shut down so I think over the last 10 years what's been happening is th that space is opening up and you have a lot of creative producers making their own things in film in, in, in writing and all of that fascinates me that, that's, that's yeah Dogma. I just can't handle dogma. People who are like, the world is the way it is. Our job is to follow the rules like this, the way the rules were said. And uh, 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 so dogma in general, I, 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 my body does not like to accept things in boxes. So you say, Oh, you put a box, you occupy, uh, I'll be there when you put the box there. Um, I think, for me, I think b being middle class uh, or from a middle class family uh, or background, uh, uh, that's also, it's, it's a big issue for me th uh, dealing with uh, the very instrumental uh you know the thing that the african middle class does well is we pass exams like there's no better fucking exam passing machines <laughs> created um and once you pa when you pass the exams you want to enter what is now i guess the international middle class uh and so Anything that interferes with that process, imagining, reading, is a problem. So if you're in a, in a continent where um, you're only now beginning to re, in some countries like Nigeria, re-industrialize or re reconceptualize such things where you're supposed to make new things, what you have is a middle class that is terrified of innovating, of trying new things. And it's very good at being given. You're told, do it like this, like this, like this, like this. And then they do it excellently. Um, you'll see uh, now in, in, in the U.S. Uh, a very, very high visibility in the U.S. and the U.K. And I've been interested in that also, in this sort of strange exceptionalism. In a very, very high... Uh, percentage of African immigrants doing exceptionally well in high institutions in America, uh, in banking, huge. Uh, all these sorts of people I was finishing high school with who left, mm -hmm. those who went to do physics, banking, uh, <laughs> literature, ba philosophy, banking. Um, so what you have also is you have this strange relationship between a, an extremely, often extremely successful high diaspora who are away, some of whom now becoming a returning as economic growth is happening very turbulently with capital from their banking masters. Uh, and sometimes they've been retrenched from the banking capitals and now they become players here. Of course, just like India, Africa right, Africa, the African writing environment also has new and growing and changing local ecosystems of writing. Um, and so what we've seen since the change of democracy is growing sort of independent publishing going on, Kwani and many, many others now. Um, and more recently, in the last three, four years, a lot of digital publishing going on. Uh, just a lot of young people with all i don't even know how many now they're just everywhere uh, independent moves saying oh no we don't like that one we're doing sci-fi so it's uh, what's nice is you had people like kwani having a big umbrella uh, and now things are breaking off under the umbrella and things are coming from outside making their own things and they're like we are the anti-kwani or we're just our own thing 
or we don't know who we are. So I, that's the interesting side is that you have all these, you really have a phenomenon of, of a certain kind of differentiated expression, you know, expressions. Um, uh, and so the next, the explosion has happened already in the last three years. So you'll be seeing very, very, very dramatic growths and changes in the next five years in the literary, in the literary world here. I've been tweeting for maybe three, four years now, I don't know. But in the last last year, um, it was I was very bored and very depressed last year, especially after my friends died and stuff happened. And so and I was of course be of writing the book. So you're like writing, I'm writing, but it's not coming, then you go and tweet, then you go and tweet. So we got into the habit of tweeting. Um but also, you know, it's a new place to try things. Uh and I'm those people who can't resist when you put something to try there. Then you, you close and I, I, I don't go and try it. Um, I like the form a, a lot. I, it's difficult to engage with other social media. Facebook I do, yeah, but not so much, as much. Uh, I like Twitter a lot because somehow it's a kind of strange space where the electricity of what you're engaging with finds you uh, and you find it I'm a libertarian in transition I'm, li I'm a libertarian looking for a home like I don't know where to land um, so I mean being part of that IMF generation you're skeptical of all authority generally so I was always recognizing the power to be sitting in this a known country in a world where you, f you can make a lot of power for yourself because you are committed to not just the technology but the platform in a way they are not. Mm -hmm.